This goes back, folks, to stuff, you know, in the 1919s. I mean, this is post-World War I anti-drug hysteria that had a lot to do with things like racism. And we're sticking to it now. And we're not justifying why the, you know, approach that was so irrational and racism-based and everything else from Henry Anslinger's time and before is still relevant now. We're just saying there's a Schedule One drug, uh, you know, you can't be federal law, Trump state law, and we just we don't go into the actual merits of the case. I guess you could say. Now, here's part of the interesting question when it comes to the issue of these states deciding. And by the way, I should say opinion polls are interesting because, of course, different sections of the country have different opinions on this. But by and large, it appears in most of the polls that I've looked at that mo a slight majority of Americans um, believe medical marijuana should be legal. And depending on which state you go into, there are some states, obviously, because they're voting this way, where a majority of people think recreational use should be legal. Even in the states where uh, they're more conservative, the numbers are still pretty high, if not a majority. So there's a lot of Americans who've turned on this issue, and this has been perhaps a trend that's been going on for a long time. Now, the question that comes into play always, though, is whose job is it to change this, you know, scheduling classification of the marijuana drug? Because that would alter everything. A Schedule One drug is the most restrictive category the federal government has. If you change this to a Schedule Two drug, all of a sudden you can justify some of these voter approved mandates. The federal government can lay off. There can be all sorts of different approaches. The Schedule One thing puts this in a category of drug nuclear war. I mean, there is no compromise. And no one's talking about this in any meaningful way at the Department of Justice or the federal government at the presidential level that we're allowed to be in on. There are several stories about how high level deliberations are going on. But you don't get to hear those deliberations. Is this a secret, Ben, like the war on terror? We're going to compromise means and methods if the American people know what the government is saying about the pros and cons of marijuana use or whether or not Colorado and Washington and other states should be allowed to do this. I mean, how come we can't be in on this? How come the government doesn't have to come out and say, here's our view of this. Here's why we think A, B or C. Here's the opposing view and hash this thing out. Now, I was starting to say before I digressed a minute ago that it's not even particularly clear whose job it is to change all this, you know, the way things are. You would look at the Constitution and you would say that this is probably Congress's gig, right? They are the lawmakers under the constitutional design. And there are bills that have been making their way through the various houses of Congress. There's one called uh, House Resolution 2306. Um, that was sponsored by people like Barney Frank and Ron Paul. And what's interesting about this, by the way, is that this House resolution was either sponsored by people who know that they're leaving office or who've been voted out of office. So it's um, always intriguing that once the you know, need to run for re-election is gone, now we can sponsor marijuana legalization measures. Uh, I have a story here in my hot little hands that says that three Colorado Democratic legislators are going to get on the bandwagon. This this contradicts what I just said, Ben, about you know legislators who are on their way out. But in states where the public has just voted to legalize this stuff at, at, at least small levels of use, um, one of them being Colorado, the legislators are now going to propose that some of this stuff be changed. And, and Congress is the proper place to do this, as I said, constitutionally. Now, here's the rub, though, on these questions. You would think, OK, well, these people will propose it. Congress will vote on it and we'll get to hear, you know, these, these legislators getting up in front of the podium on C-SPAN, speaking, of course, to empty rooms because all the legislators are really out at the phone banks, you know, soliciting money for re-election. But that doesn't matter. At least C-SPAN will run this. We'll have a debate. They'll have to get up and state their positions and why they think this is so dangerous. It should be or shouldn't be a Schedule One drug anymore. No. American system isn't quite that open. The person whose job it is to decide if this gets a hearing and if we get to have the debate that I'm asking for right now happens to be the person who is the Judiciary Committee's chairman. Currently, that's Lamar Smith, a Republican from Texas. He doesn't want to have hearings, so they're not going to happen. That's all it takes, folks. That's all it takes. That guy gets to block hearings. And believe me, I guarantee you, there's a lot of people who are glad that he is. 
again, the reason I like this is because this is part of forcing the government to answer questions openly that they don't want to deal with. Lamar Smith is providing cover for a lot of other people who don't want to take a side on this, don't want to answer it, and just want to say, yes, it would be great if fill in the blank. If you're a real conservative, maybe you say, it would be great if the Obama administration would finally do their job and have the Department of Justice crack down on all these potheads. If you're a liberal Democrat, maybe you say it would be great if the Department of Justice would finally rationally re-examine the Schedule One classification and get more blah, 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 blah. But you don't have to because Lamar Smith just blocked this whole thing for you. Whew, you're off the hook. Now, the other place that the responsibility for how this whole thing is handled could lie is the Department of Justice, which is a federal government agency, of course, and the president runs that. He's the one that can basically go to his attorney general and say, let me tell you how we're going to handle this marijuana thing in these states. Now, let's be honest about the challenges and why this issue is a little bit bigger than just, is marijuana as dangerous as alcohol and all these other kind of things? When you had a policy in place for as long as we've had this drug prohibition thing going on, you have all sorts of stuff you've done since the original prohibition that might be undone if you change it. Case in point, anti-drug treaties we have with lots of other people. Mexico is already making noise about this because it affects a lot of the violence we see south of the border, much of it's drug and importation and exportation related. Not just that. It's already affecting questions relating to drug testing, okay? Because, for example, if you have people in states where you're legally allowed to smoke marijuana recreationally off the job, what happens when you go to your job-mandated drug test and test positive for marijuana because you used it two weeks ago when you were on vacation and nobody would have cared except that it showed up in a drug test because marijuana shows up in a drug test for a long time? What do you do then? I read a story recently talking about how this is going to m mandate changes on how, I think it was Washington State, not Colorado, how policemen are hired in the state. Because currently there's a rule that says that you can't have used marijuana within a certain period of time. I want to say it was like three years. And they're thinking about changing that now to one year because obviously, you know, if this stuff is legal, um, you know, it changes how you can sort of mandate what a person was allowed to do or not allowed to do. I mean, for example, if you're allowed to smoke cigarettes under the law and somebody catches you smoking cigarettes, I mean, legally, what can they do to you? Well, that's changing too, but neither here or there right now. The point is, is that there are all sorts of established legal precedents that are going to fall by the wayside if you change these rules. Now, that doesn't mean the rules shouldn't be changed. It just means it's perhaps not totally cut and dried. Now, I would like to point out that in my opinion, and I've said this for many years, the war on drugs has been perhaps the number one most damaging things to some of your rights and freedoms in this country that we've ever seen. I mean, we talk about how the Fourth Amendment, the right against search and seizure, has been destroyed over the years. Well, the search for drugs has been one of the main reasons why. When the government is concerned, for example, and goes to the Supreme Court and says that they need to be able to break down the front door of homes, um, you know, and, and enter into them really quickly because evidence can be destroyed if they don't. The main evidence that they're worried about is drugs being flushed down the toilet, right? It used to be that they were a little bit worried about things like flash paper, which might have records on it. And, you know, here's the records of my criminal enterprise and the police knock on the door and I... I, I put a match to them and boom, they're gone and there go the records. It doesn't work that way anymore. Those records are on a hard drive on a computer somewhere. Now they're just worried about you flushing the cocaine down the toilet, right? Or the heroin down the toilet. These are all things that change if the rules change. Doesn't mean the rules shouldn't change. We also know, because how often do we talk about what a corrupt system we have in this country, that there is a hell of a lot of money inside channels that are connected to this issue, right? There's lots of money, for example, that people connected with prisons give to our elected officials. The prison population has swelled every time the war on drugs, you know, notches up another level. I mean, you look at how the prison population swelled after the middle 1980s crackdown on things like crack cocaine and everything, uh, these mandatory sentencing laws and everything else. One of the big things that pro-legalization advocates always point out is how much money we could save, how many people we could 
released from prison who are there for nonviolent drug offenses and everything. That's not a plus if you work in the prison industry or if you invest highly in it. That's a negative, right? 